I'm going to begin with um, a reading about the temptation of Jesus and then about the Buddha. Uh, so I invite you to listen to it carefully. It's, it's, it's understood by most scholars as legend. Uh, so that you don't need to take it literally, but it's interesting nonetheless. All right. So this, this reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan and for 40 days was led by the Spirit up and down the wilderness and tempted by the devil. At that time, he had nothing to eat, and at the end of it, he was famished. And the devil said to him, If you were the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, Human beings cannot live on bread alone. Next, the devil led him up and showed him in a flash all the kingdoms of the world. All these I will give to you, he said, and the glory that goes with it. All you have to do is pay me homage. Jesus answered, Scripture says you shall do homage to the Lord your God and worship no one else. The devil then took him to Jerusalem and set him on the parapet of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For scripture says God will give his angels orders to take care of you. And also, quote, they will support you in their arms lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it has been said, you are not to put the Lord your God to the test. So having come to the end of all his temptations, the devil departed, biding his time. All right. Now clearly this story is the stuff of, of legend since temptation of the savior is a common theme in, in many religions. Um, just like the virgin birth and the wise men following the star, that these are common in Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrians, Christianity, etc. But as a legend, it's, it's kind of interesting, this particular, this particular temptation. Uh, Jesus' first temptation is to change a stone into bread so he could eat after 40 days of fasting. And the gospel says he was famished, so this would have been a strong temptation. Is that giving us too much? Uh, yeah, very good. Yeah, I was tempted to disagree with you, but you know. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. So anyway, he, he would have been famished. Uh, so, so that was his first temptation to change a stone into bread. The second temptation is power. All the kingdoms of the world I will give you if you do homage to me. And you know, uh, Sigmund Freud once said uh, that the dominant drive in humanity is the pleasure principle. In fact, psychoanalysis is kind of built on that. But, he, but Alfred Adler, who was a student of Freud's, said our dominant drive is for power. So in this story, Freud's is his first temptation. Adler's is the second power over the world. First one is pleasure from eating, second is power. But the third temptation is the most ingenious one. The devil doesn't actually offer anything. He merely says, prove that you are who you say you are. Jump down from this pinnacle. If you believe in God, and if you're God's son, God will protect you. Now, that doesn't sound like a temptation. The devil isn't offering bread or kingdoms. In fact, he's being rather religious. He's even quoting scripture, for heaven's sake. Psalm 91 says, God will give angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So the devil's quoting right from the scripture, which Jesus has been using to refute him. Uh, so the devil is basically saying, you know, you, you keep quoting scripture, which says God will protect you if you fall. So prove it, jump, and we'll see what happens. So Jesus has been tempted by a sense pleasure, then power, and then best of all, spiritual pride. That's the hardest one to resist. Incidentally, when I was young and I heard the story growing up Catholic uh, of the devil tempting Jesus, we believed Jesus was God. So we thought that when he told the devil not to uh, test the Lord thy God, he was referring to himself as God, as in don't tempt me devil, I am God. But that's not what he would have meant. He would have meant don't tempt, tempt God by throwing yourself off a cliff assuming God will have to run in, rush in and save you. And that's what testing God meant. Incidentally, just, this is just kind of an aside, but uh, in studying to be a Catholic priest uh, and going to a seminary for, for nine years, um, 
I remember once asking the professor, we were studying church history, and I said, it, and, they, and we were studying Jesus' teachings, etc. And they said, Jesus didn't believe he was God because he couldn't have him been accepted as a rabbi or teacher of any kind you know, uh, among Jews. And I said, if Jesus didn't believe he was God, why do we? And he said, well, the church vote, voted on it in 321. And I thought, all this is because of a vote? You know, anyway, another, another story. Now, Buddha's story is very interesting, too. He's tempted like Jesus just before he begins his ministry. He's sitting in meditation underneath the Bodhi tree. That means the enlightenment tree. Uh, and he's on the verge of receiving enlightenment when Mara, an evil spirit, comes to tempt him away from his concentrations. And Mara's first attack is with sensual desire. So he parades three beautiful and sensuous goddesses in front of the Buddha hoping that'll distract him from his meditation. But it doesn't work. And I must say, if it had been me, it wouldn't have worked either, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> then, Mara, then Mara tries to frighten Buddha with death. He sends hurricanes, rainstorms, showers of flaming rock and a great darkness. But Buddha still doesn't budge. So then the evil one challenges Buddha's right to be doing what he's doing but the earth witnesses to Buddha and makes Mara flee. Like Jesus then, Buddha is tempted three times before he begins his ministry. But unlike Jesus, he also has a fourth temptation. And it occurs after he has already received enlightenment. He's already pierced the bubble of the universe, so they say, and the earth itself quakes with wonder for six days, and lotuses bloom on every tree, and 10,000 galaxies shudder in awe. But Mara now has one last temptation. He does not offer money or possessions or beautiful women. Like the devil who tempted Jesus, he presents something rather more ingenious. He tells Buddha, yes, you have achieved enlightenment. Nothing I can do could take that away. But now that you've received it, Surely you realize no one else is ever going to understand. Enlightenment can't be explained. It can only be experienced. So why not just slip into nirvana yourself and leave the world to its own devices? You've already made it. And the reasoning here is actually rather sound. Buddha hasn't expected this temptation, and he has to think about it for a long time before deciding it's worth it. Uh, and. Uh, he, he realizes some people will understand. Again, a temptation to do the wrong thing, but for what seems to be a good reason. And let's see, I believe I brought my tape. I'm known for my props, so here we go. Can most of you see this? Yeah. All right. I'll, be, I'll be referring to it with words anyway, but okay, straighten it out. All righty. I think a lot of our moral choices are complex combinations of good and evil. And as I see it, and this is a vast oversimplification, but the four basic categories are doing good for a good reason, doing good for a bad reason, doing bad for a good reason, and doing bad for a bad reason. Some examples. There was a story in the paper once, uh, I think it was maybe in 1997, about a taxi cab driver in Mexico City his name was Manuel Lubion, and someone had left $53,000 in his cab, which was worth more in 1997 than now. He spent two days hunting for the passenger, and when offered a reward, he said he couldn't take it. Someone asked him, why didn't he just keep the money? And you know what he said? He said, I felt that I would lose the beauty inside me if I did that. I would... I would lose the beauty inside me. I would say that's doing good for a good reason, not for a reward, 
but for one's own integrity. Or consider Osceola McCarty, an elderly black woman from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. The, the New York Times had an editorial about her once, and they mentioned some of the big uh, donations to charity that several celebrities had given. But they focused on Ms. McCarty's gift to the University of Southern Mississippi. When she turned 87, she donated $150,000 to be used for scholarships for black students. She had made her money by washing clothes for people in her hometown, and she had lived a rather simple lifestyle, so she was able to save up all that money over the years. And you know, you know, it's, it's wonderful when people like uh, Bill and Belinda Gates or you know, would give billions of dollars to, char dollars to charity. But Ms. McCarty's gift, though smaller by comparison, represents a much larger gift of the heart. It's everything she ever earned. And it's not for any reward other than to make it possible for other African Americans to have the opportunities she didn't. And I'd say that's doing good for a good reason. Now, how about doing good for a bad reason? This one's just kind of a humorous one, but there were kids in a fourth grade class whose teacher had to leave the room for a few minutes. And when she returned, she found the children in perfect order. And everyone was sitting absolutely quiet. And she was shocked. And she said, I've never seen anything like this before. This is wonderful. But, but tell me, what came over all of you? And finally, after much urging, one little girl said, well, one time you said that if you ever came back and found us quiet, you would drop dead. <laughs> and we were hoping to see that. That's doing good, but for not very noble motives. <clears throat> On a more serious note, though, let me tell you something that Thurgood Marshall once said. You may remember he was, uh, Marshall was the first black Supreme Court justice. And in his younger days, he once talked to a Southern politician who was a white supremacist, but a, a relatively moderate one. <laughs> and Thurgood Marshall told the politician that although the segregation has promised separate but equal facilities for blacks and whites, the whites in his state had a school for nursing and the blacks had none. And this politician told Mr. Marshall, oh, I can get the state to build a nursing school for blacks but you have to allow me to use my own methods. And Sir Good Marshall agreed, and the politician immediately called a press conference, and he announced that he had just witnessed the most sickening spectacle. He said, I saw a white female nurse washing the back of a black man. And then he demanded that the state legislature immediately appropriate money for an N-word school so that this kind of thing would never happen again. The money was appropriated, the school was built, and a good thing happened, but for a pretty bad reason. Or consider the state of schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, when they were first stored, um, when, uh, when integration was first forced upon them, and in protest, all the white parents kept their children away. Well, at one point, one white family started sending their two sons to school, and eventually everyone else followed and the schools became integrated. And Robert Coles, a psychologist who studied a lot of people in this situation, asked the mother of the, of the first white kids to go back to school why she sent them back, hoping it was you know, to change the world. And, and she said, well, they were at home fighting and breaking things. So I said, you two are going to school. <laughs> now, she didn't integrate the students, uh, the schools for some great and noble reason. She did it just to get some peace and quiet, and yet, a good thing resulted. So I think doing good, even if it's, for, if it's for a bad reason, isn't always so bad. This, by the way, is the last temptation in T.S. Eliot's play, Murder in the Cathedral. Uh, incidentally, this is just another aside, but um, when I was an, a, an intern minister at the Unitarian Church in Rockford, Illinois, the church had uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it didn't have any major symbols, but it, but it had a, a big tree, you know, just kind of a tree of life and with light coming in. And someone, and they, but they, a, a theater group was putting on a play there and they were doing murder in the cathedral. And so 
um, by T.S. Eliot. So they had a crucifix up there for the, for the play. And someone came in who wasn't, wasn't involved with the church and uh, you know, saw the crucifix and saw the tree. And she said, is that tree a prop for the play? And they said, no, the cross is. <laughs> Anyway, in T.S. Eliot's play, Archbishop Thomas Beckett finds himself in an awkward position of having to defy the King of England, who had been his closest friend. If only the King had just allowed him to remain Chancellor, but King Henry made him Archbishop of Canterbury, and Beckett could not compromise the sacred office for friendship. But he is tempted. Like Jesus, like Buddha, he is tempted. The first tempter in the play comes to remind him of this friendship with the king and of all the good times they've had together. Give in to the king, he says. You know that would be easiest, but Thomas cannot agree. In comes the second tempter who suggests that Thomas resign his bishopric and become chancellor again, and that way he can escape the dilemma of choosing between his friend and his duty. Because if he's no longer bishop, he doesn't have to make the choice. But Thomas cannot accept that suggestion either. And the third tempter comes in and says, OK, keep your integrity, uphold the church's position, but at least save your skin by siding with those who want to overthrow the king. Then you'll escape being put to death by him. But Thomas cannot break his patriotic loyalty to save his religious one. And having read only of Jesus and not of Buddha, Beckett believes the temptations are over. But in comes a fourth temptation, a fourth visitor, who congratulates Thomas on overcoming the temptations of the first three. Well done, well done, Thomas, says he. Your will is hard to bend. And he doesn't try to sway Beckett from his moral duty. In fact, he agrees with Beckett that his position is the only course to take. All other ways are closed to you except the way already chosen. And you will be remembered for it. Think, Thomas. Think of glory after death. When king is dead, there's another king, and one more king is another reign. King is forgotten when another shall come, but saint and martyr rule from the tomb. That's the temptation, to have lasting fame for doing the right thing. And, and the tempter goes on, think of Pilgrim standing in line before the glittering jewel shrine, the shrine to him, of course, from generation to generation, bending the knee in supplication. Think of the miracles by God's grace and think of your enemies in another place. This last temptation is the most ingenious and the most difficult to refuse because the tempter has not asked the archbishop to do the wrong thing. On the contrary, he's encouraged him to do the right thing, but only in order to have the glory that comes with martyrdom. And Thomas sees through this one and says, now my way is clear, now is the meaning plain. Temptation shall not come in this kind again. The last temptation is the greatest reason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. Now, I must say, with, with all due respect to T.S. Eliot, I don't get all that upset when people do the right thing for the wrong reason. I'm just glad they did the right thing at all. Consider the mother hen who sits on her eggs all day. If she doesn't keep them warm all over, they won't hatch and become little chickens. So she sits on them for a while and then gets up and carefully turns them over a bit and then sits on them again. The hen keeps doing this so that the eggs will be warmed all over, not just on top and the embryos inside will be able to develop and hatch. And it's, it's a really very beautiful thing, all this careful sitting and turning. It looks pretty much like motherly love until you find out the reason for it. After a mother hen lays her eggs, her rear end gets rather hot, and she sits on her eggs to cool off. But after she sits for a while, the tops of the eggs warm up, so she turns them over to get the cool side out. <laughs> Then she can sit on them some more and get a little relief. There's no love here as far as we can tell. The hen is just trying to spell relief. And yet, a good thing happens. Do you think the little chicks care that their mother was just trying to cool her fanny? No, they're just glad to be alive. They don't care why she did it. All right, now we get to doing a bad thing, but for a good reason. 
I think of a story I read about a concert held in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the pieces included, uh, featured a flute solo, but the flutist was supposed to play from a distance away. So the conductor told him to stand off stage and then count the measures precisely so he could come in at exactly the right time. And on the performance night, when the time came for the flute solo, the flutist began, or flautist, I guess is the technical word, uh, began on time. Suddenly there was a pinching sour note and, and then no more sound for the rest of the piece. And the conductor was pretty ticked off at this. And at the end of the piece, he walked off the stage to find the, the flute player. And the flute player said, Maestro, before you say anything, let me tell you what happened. You know I came in accurately and everything was going beautifully. When suddenly one of the stage hands came up, a great big guy, and he grabbed away my flute and pushed me back saying, stop you idiot, don't you know there's a concert going on here? <laughs> this is a case of the stage hand having very good intentions, but still doing the wrong thing. Personally, I think a lot of the evil that's done in the world fits into this category. From, from parents who punish their children too severely, but, but think that they're giving them the discipline they need, to zealots who destroy public or private property, believing they're serving a greater cause. And in our own lives too, I think this is true. Many of us don't really intend to be rude or thoughtless, I mean, we are, but we don't intend to be. Shalom Aleichem, who's a Yiddish writer, tells a story about an old man standing on a crowded bus. And the young guy next to him turned to him and said, do you know what time it is? And the old man wouldn't answer or say a word. So the young man walked away. And later, a friend of the old man said, why were you so rude to that guy? You know, the guy who asked for the time. And the old man said, well, if I'd given him the time of day, next he'd probably want to know where I'm going. Then we might talk about our interests. If we did that, he might invite himself over to my house for dinner. And if he did, he would meet my lovely granddaughter. And if he met her, they might both fall in love. And I don't want my granddaughter marrying someone who can't afford a watch. <laughs> of course, most of us wouldn't think this convolutedly, but when we are rude or thoughtless, it sometimes is for the best of reasons, at least we think it is. And the trick is, when you see other people doing things that you believe are evil, and we see a lot of that today, to allow them into category three, bad but for a good reason. They might be just bad for a bad reason, but see if you can put them in the other category. Don't assume their intentions are all bad. I'll give you an example. John Wolfe, um, was the minister, minister at the church I used to serve in the, uh, and he was there in the uh, 1950s. Incidentally, another aside, John Wolfe, the church at the time was called Church of the Good Shepherd, and he always made a joke about the, the pastor of the Good Shepherd being a wolf. Uh, <laughs> but that's, anyway, he once told her about an experience he had when he was a young minister, when a woman came to see him several months after her divorce. And here's what he writes. I shall never forget, it was early in my ministry and I was a very young man. A woman much older than I came to see me several months after her divorce from a very religious husband. The minister of their church had insisted, even though her husband had physically abused her, threatened her, intimidated her and their children, that it was her duty to stay with him and to, quote, search her soul for the fault within her. Now, as you might imagine, after the divorce, this woman was literally shunned by that minister and by the whole congregation. Frantically, she consulted the clergy and counseling services of various other churches. In every place she went, she heard the same thing. It's your duty as a wife. You should try harder. You have an obligation to your children. They shouldn't have to live in a broken home. You should remember your solemn vows. And finally, someone suggested that you talk to a Unitarian minister. And at last, she came to see John Wolfe. And he said, it was the beginning of a long series of conversations that we had and a referral to a good family counselor I knew, he says. I probably shouldn't tell you this, she said to me at the end of our first session, but I had made up my mind that if you said the same things to me that all the other ministers I've talked to have said, 
then I was going to go home, put my car in the garage, leave the engine running, and finish it all. And he says, I know she meant it. Now, when you hear a story like that, you think those people who told her she had to stay with her husband, terrible thing, they could have caused her death. And you think how fortunate she found someone who could undo the damage. And you're right in both cases. However, we shouldn't assume that the clergy and churches who condemned her were in category four. What they did was wrong, but it was also most likely with good intentions. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you shouldn't fight injustice wherever you find it and try to do, undo the damage wherever it's afflicted. But we need to do that while understanding that we can never fully enter the soul of another person. So we must be careful in our judgments. So there you have an admittedly oversimplified diagram of morality. One, two, three, and four. Be grateful for people who do good for good reasons. Be even grateful for people who do good for bad reasons. It may not matter to those who are helped. Be understanding of people who do evil but think they're doing good. And be careful before you decide anyone belongs in number four. I invite your questions, comments, whatever you would like at this time. Yeah, we got one here. It reminds me of the dilemma that we sometimes have. I think of being out hiking and seeing coming across a 